Yeah, one of the things that they, um, they had us do as, as new astronauts was um, pretty soon after we all arrive, and then this continues to be done, is get a ride in the, uh, well, back in those days, it was the KC-135, and they've changed the airplanes on several occasions. You'll, you'll be going, I guess, on zero G, right, which is a modified 727. Not quite as much room inside, but um, I enjoyed the experience. Um, I should say I don't have a particularly strong stomach for aerobatics. Um, you know, we spend a lot of time flying in the NASA T-38 supersonic training jets. Um, and one of the reasons for that is to be able to experience different gravitational stimuli. And I found, you know, after a few minutes of doing barrel rolls, I was ready to get the bag. Um, that's when I also found that um, the medication that, that was commonly in use at the time, uh, a mixture of scopolamine and dexedrine, was extremely effective for me. And, and so I regularly use that for the KC-135, uh, the zero gravity flights. Um, and because I enjoyed them, uh, I would often volunteer to go up and, and help carry out experiments, and uh, sometimes when they were flying, I'd just call, you know, do you have an extra seat? And I'll just go and float around, have some fun. Uh, and after a while, I really got used to just being in zero G, so I'll just share the experience, and, and as I guess Larry and Heiko were talking about, you know, you get 20, 25 seconds of weightlessness and then you pay the penalty, you have to pull out. And I found for me, uh, if I had time, if I could lie on my back, um, for me, that was the least provocative. There, there were people there, you know, the, the people who do it all the time. And, and you do build up, uh, uh, you know, kind of an immunity to, most people do anyway, to, to getting uh, motion sick. And they would just stand up during the pullout. And I tried that a couple of times, but it didn't make me feel good. So um, again, everybody's experience is different, and you know, you'll have a chance to see how it affects you. But uh, I'll just share with you the experience on my first flight, and then we can talk a little bit more about designing experiments for weightlessness. Um, and that is. Uh, you know, people had told me, be, be prepared for more vibration and shaking and noise than you've ever imagined. And, and I thought I was prepared, but I have to say when they lit the solid boosters and everything starts shaking and, and you know, I, I thought this, this can't be right, you know, the, the wings are going <laughs> to fall off or something. And, and then, so it's quite a ride. And then, of course, after the boosters fall off, you, you gradually accelerate. And the shuttle never went more than about three Gs, but still, you're pressed back in your seat. It's not particularly comfortable. I mean, any healthy person can tolerate three Gs. And then, after eight and a half minutes, it gets very quiet. The engines shut down. And I felt myself floating up in my seat. And I had this strange feeling oh, I'm weightless. I'm in an environment that I already understand. And that, of course, is the whole purpose of training. And then after about a minute, I realized I was still in my seat because I was bracing for the pullout just by force of habit. <laughs> and, and that's when it really hit me. No, wait a minute, stupid, no pullout. You know, you're, you're in space. And then I floated over the window and there was the coast of Africa coming over the horizon. And it was, that was, Pretty incredible, but but that training was really really useful because um, you know there's just going through launch is such an incredible experience, and then if you had never been weightless before, which of course was the situation for many of the original astronauts, uh, you know what I don't know what what it would do to your mental state. Um, I spent a lot of time working with. Uh, scientists, probably because of my own science background, um, 
looking at the experiments that they were designing and, and trying to help make whatever changes might be useful for, for making uh, things work better. One of the, uh, the things that most people never thought of, but it, it's just a fact of life, uh, when you're uh, weightless is that cables, wires have a life of their own. I mean, everything lies on your desk nicely, gravity pulls it down. It will become a rat's nest when it starts floating around. And, uh, you know, in, in originally in, in the shuttle, most of our experiments you would plug in and there would be long cords and, and they would just be floating all over the place and, and they would get in the way. So make sure that anything that could possibly be floating around is properly secured. And that of course goes not just for your cords, but most people, many people anyway, don't think about uh, all of the cords and wires in the experiments and, because that, that can really mess things up. Um, in the, for, the, for the airplane, uh, you're only having short periods of, of weightlessness, so thermal uh, dissipating heat is not such a problem. In the early days of the shuttle, there was a very high rate, uh, particularly for the experiments, they, a lot of the experiments were put into mid-deck lockers and they had power supplies and the like and, um, and they would work fine on the ground and then they would take them up into space and remember once you're weightless you have no uh, density driven convection so you don't have convective heat uh, dissipation and many experiments actually overheated you know they finally got a handle on that um, if you're doing anything in enclosed, or you know, a lot of experiments that I've seen are they're in plastic boxes or something, and there, yes, you do have to worry about dissipation. But the chances are, if it works in the lab, it's going to work in in the airplane because you're only weightless for 20 or 25 seconds. Um, you know, it's hard to give uh, general advice for how to design an experiment. I saw some of the thing, and, and particularly in, in this group, if it's anything like last year, you know, you're gonna be all over the place in the different things you design. But the most important uh, advice that, that we would give everybody before flying was to, to the best degree you possibly can, go through everything that you're gonna have to do. Um, you know, if, if you have a more complicated experiment, you need three people, you know, one person's doing one thing, another is doing another, go through it. Because particularly if you start to feel a little bit not, not so, so good up there, having practiced things over and over and over again so that you can kind of do things almost by memory um, without having to exert a lot of conscious attention to think about what you're supposed to do next. That's a real help. So we just, um, you know, work through whatever procedures you're, you're going to need and, and um, practice and practice. Um, have things tend to break. Um, we, we've seen that in, in many, many cases, so uh, make sure you have proper tools, spare parts, you know, try to anticipate problems before they occur because, uh, you know, it's a strange environment and uh, things will happen that, that you didn't expect. Jeff, yes. on that subject, I was mentioning the importance of developing malfunction procedures and going through them in simulations so, so that if a, if a problem arises you can say right, go to this particular valve. Yeah, come, come yeah it's, it, it's a little different I think on the KC-1 on the, on the zero gravity plane than, than when you're actually up in space because uh, the 
but but the basic idea is try try to think through at to, to as deep a degree as you can everything that might go wrong uh, and and what you would do uh, you know if, if something try to identify the weak parts of the experiment yeah that that's definitely important advice um, one of one of the um, I think most gratifying things that I, I did in uh, prepare, helping people prepare for zero G. This was one of one of my early job assignments was to uh, go up periodically to NASA's Glenn Research Center. Back then it was the Lewis Research Center. Now it's named after John Glenn. But they were developing combustion experiments that were going to be done, uh, and combustion. In zero G, uh, it, it's very different. Are you, <coughs> have you all seen pictures of flames, like candle flames, you know, instead of going straight up because the hot air rises, they just become spherical. But there are many other things that uh, they wanted to experiment with. And so I helped in the design of, of a glove box, the combustion friendly glove box that you could do these experiments in with uh, exhaust and everything. And then um, on my fifth and final space flight, I actually got to use that equipment. Uh, it was the first time they, it, it, took, it took a long time, almost 15 years from when they first started designing it till it finally started flying. But uh, yeah, I actually got to make fires up in space, which was a lot of fun. And some very strange things, by the way. Uh, and there are, uh, there there have been uh, some interesting combustion experiments done on the zero gravity airplane. But there, of course, you can only investigate phenomena that are going to take place over 20 seconds or so. But when you have a little bit longer, just as one example, um, there there is one experiment where you have a piece of flammable paper and in the middle you have a hot wire that starts the paper burning and then you have a, a fan blowing air in this direction. So, I mean, what would happen on Earth? Well, the air is blowing in this direction and so the flame propagates along with the airflow. In space, because you don't have the, the convection which basically moves the uh, burnt air out of the way and fresh oxygen rushes in. Behind the flame, uh, there was not very much oxygen, and so the flame actually propagated into the wind rather than away from the wind. So there's a lot of things that were totally counterintuitive. Uh, and, and it was a lot of fun because, I mean, I like making fires, yeah. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, I commented on the value of a training of making the crew part of your experiment team, both in terms of the knowledge you gain from you guys, as well as having really an ally during the, during the mission. Could you, could you comment on that? Well, that's certainly true when you're going up into space, because yes. the, the crew members, are the, they're the people who are going to perform your experiments. Um, and uh, to the degree that they feel some, whether it's an emotional tie or, or a, certainly an understanding of, of why you're doing this, a, a feeling for the value of the experiment, um, you know, that's, they're, they're going to, it's not like they're not going to pay attention, but somehow if you're invested in, in an experiment, you're more likely to be fully committed to doing whatever is possible to make it work. Um, but in this case, I mean, you'll be, you're the crew, you're, you're the ones, I mean, they, they have crew members on the plane, but they're basically looking out for your safety and making sure that nobody gets in anybody's way. And don't, don't expect them to help with your experiments. You, you've got to be able to do it on your own. Um, yeah, I mean, if, <laughs> an example of the sorts of things they'll do when you, you get a buzzer usually about five seconds I assume they still do this b before you, the pull out or, or they flash the lights anyway you, you get a few seconds and the idea is you know get in get down on the floor 
you don't want to be floating up on the ceiling when you pull out two G's. And one of the things that the crew on the plane, if they look around, if they see anybody up on the ceiling, they'll quick fly over there and yank them down to the floor. And you don't want people hitting the floor at two G's. That's, that's no fun. Um, what else can I say about, um, you know, one, one thing I, I mean, you're up there to do work, okay? But I hope that you get a chance just to experience the incredible effect that zero G has on your body. And I don't mean the long-term effects. I mean, don't worry about calcium loss from your bones. That's, you know, you're not up there for long enough. But just the, the feeling of a, a body which is in a totally different environment um, you know, it, it's, um, some people say that it's life-changing. I mean, you'll, you'll get a sense of what it means for your body to have weight. Um, and, and that's something I, I often talk with my students about. Um, uh, let me ask you, what, what is it that, that creates weight? Why do we have weight here on Earth? This is not a trick question. Yeah, gravity, okay. Um, so now I'm going to do a little experiment for you. All right. I have weight. If I had a, a scale attached to my feet, it would register about 70 kilos, roughly. Okay. When I was falling through the air, what would that scale have registered? I still have mass. What I was doing was exactly what you're going to be doing on the airplane. I mean, that airplane is, is following a free fall trajectory, if the pilot does it right, and you're following that same trajectory. But what does the scale register when I was falling through the air or when you're falling through the, in the airplane? Hmm? Nothing, exactly. You're weight, that's the point. You're weightless. Did gravity go away? Hell no, I was falling towards the ground. Um, so, yes, in one sense, gravity is producing weight, but uh, it's not just gravity. Because when I'm standing on the, on the ground, well, let me give you a hint, Newton's third law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so, gravity is pushing me, or pulling me towards the Earth, and the Earth is pushing back. And that's why, and if I had a scale between my feet and the ground, that force, you have the Earth pulling down, gravity pulling back, it's squeezing the scale, the springs, and that is really what gives us a sense of weight. You know, it pushes up to the bottom of my feet and then that force is transmitted through my skeleton, through the rest of my body. So here's the paradox. Um, when you're in free fall, whether I'm falling here just a couple of feet or whether you're in the airplane, the only force that's acting on you is gravity. That's the same when you're in orbit, assuming that there's no air resistance or anything. You know, there are very small forces, which, why, which is why we call it micro-G rather than zero-G. But basically, the only force that's acting on you is gravity. And so that's kind of the paradox. If the only force that is acting on you is gravity, you are weightless. It's when there's something which is acting against gravity that's pushing you in the other direction. That's what creates our sense of weight. Not something that, that we're ever aware of on the ground. I mean, we just feel ourselves being heavy and you step on the scale and you don't really think about it. But you're going to be in a situation where you know, gravity doesn't go away. <laughs> But there's no other force. If, if the pilot flies the plane right on the proper arc, 
and you're going to be falling inside the plane at the same rate that the plane is falling. So it's the same thing as you know the old thought experiment if you're in the elevator and you cut the, the cord and while you're falling gravity is still active but the elevator floor is no longer pushing on you and so you uh, you no longer have any weight. So are you saying it's wrong to to speak of an equilibrium between the centrifugal force and the gravity in, when you're in the space station? There is no such thing as centrifugal force. There is no such thing. Uh, that, that's a pseudo force, right? The only force that's acting on you in orbit is gravity. Um, so uh, uh, forgetting about, about if you were to stop, right? If you were to stop, you the space station would fall down. Exactly. So, so what holds it in place? cannot just be gravity. Yes. It, well, it's because it's going fast. It's falling. It's in a state of free fall. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's a little so hard to, to get the concept to somebody that the space station is constantly falling because it's not getting any closer to the Earth. But if you turned off gravity, the space station would just go off in a straight line. And, in, yes. and, and instead, it, it's constantly pulled back towards the Earth, and, and so, yeah, it's in a state of free fall where the only force acting on it is gravity, but it's going fast enough that okay, so the rate at which it's falling puts it on the same path as the curvature of the Earth, and so you just keep going around the Earth. Centrifugal force is a nice concept when you're talking about you know slinging something around in a string, you definitely feel that it's pulling on you, and that's what we call centrifugal force. But in terms of actual physics, it's it's a pseudo force. It's it's not real. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so you know when you're getting up there, you can play that game with with uh, some of the other people who are are with you about you know why they don't feel any weight even though there's still gravity and you know what causes weight and it's it's a simple concept once you get it but most people have never thought of it in that way so just remember the only force on you is gravity you're weightless uh, yeah do you recommend that they take a tennis ball and be able to well, there's lots of lots of fun things you can do. I mean, yeah, one of, one of the things that uh, they would often do when we came back from space was to uh, throw throw a ball, uh, you know, a tennis ball at us. And of course, if, if if the ball seems to be coming like this, I'll put my hand down here because I know the ball is going to come down. Whereas in space, of course, the ball just goes in a straight line. And there's all all sorts of uh, things. I'm sorry now I didn't bring my computer because I've got a, there's a nice, uh, maybe if, if, it, if we come in, again towards the end I'll, I'll show it. There's a, uh, a great video of a pop group that they, they made in, in, in Russia. I, I don't know if any of you have seen that. Um, I'll, I'll bring it back another time. Yeah, um, so I'll be curious to see what uh, people come up with. And when, you know, these are just kind of general comments about the environment and things to look out for, but uh, it's really when you get into the nitty gritty of designing your experiments or whatever apparatus, whatever it is you're, you're going to fly with, um, then um, it, it's good to get somebody who's familiar with the environment to look at what you're going to do and try to identify potential problems because it is a different world and, and you know just over and over again we would see people designing experiments that for various reasons were, were going to have big problems. If you're going to do anything with liquids for instance, you know liquids obviously you've seen pictures of astronauts floating around with bubbles and by the way they don't want you to do that in the middle of the airplane <laughs> because it makes a mess. But, um, anything you're going to do with liquids, um, you, you need a lot of special preparation and of course there's safety considerations and, and the like, but containing liquids is very important. <laughs>